Welcome back to the In My Beach Boys Room podcast. I am Adam Schreiner. I am here with Matthew Hartz. So I did a little uh, listening of Carl and the Passions and the Spring album. Mm-hmm. So we'll get to we'll get to those yeah. little musical uh, analysis when when we get to that in the when timeline happen, when it happens in the chronology. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and then we'll we'll just go over some of those songs. I don't you know a little foreshadowing. I don't love them. But mm-hmm. I do love some songs on them. So, yeah. So mm-hmm. we'll get we'll so we'll get we'll get to that. And it wasn't like That's my sentiments exactly too. You know, so we, we, we'll we don't want to mess yeah. up the. We, we'll get into that. So if you want to check us out on our social media, Matthew underscore Hearts is going to be Twitter, and then Instagram is Matthew Hearts Music. You can also find us on YouTube, and we have moved out of the '70s room. This is the uh, we just. This the seventies room is a little small. It's the smallest room in the museum, and so it was kind of cramped in there, and so we decided to. And some of the images have become redundant. Yeah, and so we're kind of in front of the sixty-two to sixty-four stuff out here, breathing a little bit. Yeah, more. yeah, yeah, exactly. And so the, you make sure you hop on YouTube and check out all these different shots of the museum and all the Beach Boys memorabilia that Matthew has because it's it's pretty cool. And then we have our Patreon page, and if you want to hop on and donate to the podcast, we have two tiers. Uh, if you go, if you if you donate to the higher tier, you can request a Beach Boys song for Matt to cover, and we'll do that as a thank you for for donating uh, to the cause here. And um, yeah, he'll do a cover, just kind of like the covers that we do at the beginning of all these episodes, and that we have on YouTube. So check that out, and uh, I think that's it for all the. Our house, housekeeping stuff that we do. Let's start, Matthew. Let's get going on 1972. Where, where do we start? Where do we begin? 1972 is a it's a it's an interesting period for the Beach Boys and Brian Wilson, and for a lot of reasons they had started working on the material for Carl and the Passions in the in the end of '71, and specifically the two tunes that Brian had the most involvement I see yeah <laughs> with uh mess mess of help and and Marcella you need a mess of help standalone and Marcella they had got started in late 71 and th- those were the tunes that Brian was the most involved in but he still wasn't very involved at all even though he wrote the tunes and all that stuff so he we're starting 72 is this is a period where Brian's really trying to distance himself from the Beach Boys a okay. little bit. He's he's tired of he's, this oh, he's just animal that done. he's yeah. created, and he's tired of what it forces him to do. You know what it what it in that's a big reason for the spring outlet for him. Yeah, and I, have, I really and I have questions about that. Yeah, when we get there, just because yeah, because they'd already started that. Bruce had brought in the friend David Sandler in late 71 to start working with Brian on that, and I think that was a conscious decision that was probably made by Bruce and other Jack Wright, maybe other people that said, "Hey, let's let's get Brian involved in going on something that he might enjoy a, a little bit more and it's going to be a lot less pressure." Sure. You know, and so, of course, that's Brian, when he is doing things, he's more doing the spring stuff than than being involved with the Beach Boys at all. Okay. You know, and so Carl's there at the house. Um, and we're early 72. Is that, is that where we're at right now? Yeah, like, early like, 72. Okay. And so Carl's working on the album, um, basically with Brian upstairs you know you know he comes down and and sings a couple of lines on some of the songs you know but he's not very involved i think on mess of help mess of help he might have played the some on the track uh so the carl and the passions album is getting made and getting ready to go um early in 1972 jack riley our new direction right management right. guy he makes the announcement that the Beach Boys are going to be moving to Holland to record their next album. Even Carl and the Passions hasn't been released yet. um, But they make this big announcement. And they've made this decision. They they were touring over there, I think, in 71. And they just liked the vibe over there. Jack Riley really liked the vibe of it and thought, wow, this is laid back, windmills, farm, cows, pastures, I need to get the Beach Boys out of L.A. and get them into a new environment. 
and record. You know, it, it, there were other big acts like the Stones went to France in the early '70s and made a you know a famous record in a location there. You know, so got it. it there were things like that that had happened. Maybe Riley was kind of mirroring some of that other stuff sure, that was sure. going on within the industry. Hey, yeah. we can do this. We can be super hip and do this. Right. Um, but wow, <laughs> what a what a fiasco it it and a wonderful fiasco it ends up being. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more when it happens. But okay. the announcement was made early on. Okay. Yeah, uh, got it. Got then it. also in the first in spring, whereas Ricky Fatar and Blondie also at this point had been brought in as supplemental musicians because Dennis hurt his hand, you know, yeah. with Ricky. And then, and then, oh, let's bring Blondie into, whoa, this makes this band a lot good. And it was, I think, Riley's decision, but he said, let's make these guys official Beach Boys. Okay. Whereas anybody else in their roles and capacities coming in prior or even after that. That wasn't ever a consideration to make them official Beach Boys. Right. This was a calculation at that point. Oh, wow. We're going to make these two musicians actual well, Beach official Boys. Official Beach Boys, right. You know, that will be fe featured as members of the band on, you know, Holland and concert and all this other stuff. So that was an interesting thing. A lot was made of it. Well, no, not I don't think a lot of it was made at the time, but subsequently people think about how ironic it is that it's the the Beach Boys that end up integrating one of the first bands to, you know, make black members official right. members of the Beach Boys. Sure, it's, kind of, yeah. it's a juxtaposition, you know, of what people think of the Lily White Beach Boys. Right, right, right totally. That so that's that's interesting uh if you listen to blondie and ricky talk about that whole experience for a couple of years i mean they never really considered themselves beach boys they were just musicians that were helping out right and uh you know there's i think a a, a funny statement i read from ricky during that time where uh he was really hoping when they were working on carl and the passions to get feedback they were all working in different studios but I'm, they must have been at brian's house and they were working on something and and uh ricky was playing vibes on something and uh brian came down and just was in the doorway and i guess he you just sat there and listened for a while and then daryl dragon was also in the room and he just said daryl you play vibes and that was it. Interesting. And he said that's my that was my Beach Boy feedback. That oh, was geez. you know that was the one from you know here I am playing in <laughs> this band official member and the you know that was all I got. Yeah. You know? So it, who you know that that whole thing was uh, it was a PR move. Sure. But it was it was cool too. But anyway, at this time, this is such a transition, Bruce. He starts to get, I think, mainly fed up with Jack Riley. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't even know if I could, you know, cohesively go into all of that stuff other than he didn't like the way that Riley had hyped up Surf's Up as Brian being a heavy part of because he really you wasn't know, get bruce had that famous quote said he was no more than a visitor at those sec sure. sessions you yeah. know and so anyway bruce you know for a while uh blondie and ricky were in the band with bruce too but shortly after that in uh the spring of 72 bruce leaves leaves and amicably uh <laughs> it, What's I one of the stories I hear is Bruce being at the Bellagio house in Brian's house, right? And he goes in there to work on something and he puts a no or he puts he puts a note on the outside of the door that says no Wilson's allowed. Oh. <laughs> so is there any animosity? <laughs> so he was kinda <laughs> Maybe he'd been fed up with 
something, well, you know, and <laughs> well, and then I mean, I kind of that's what happened with Mike, right? Didn't Mike say something when he got sick that like he needed a break from the Wilsons? Or oh, something that, like that was tainted by the Wilsons. Tainted, so like but, maybe you know there was a, yeah, you know there was you know you just need a break from from that. Yeah, and whereas the one the thing with Mike was I think probably more referencing an affair that had happened earlier, oh, you know, and re- whereas, um, I, you know, I know that Carl and Dennis were having problems with Bruce. I think at that time, just probably direction and all that stuff. You got to remember though, Bruce had been in since 65, right? He'd been a big part of the records. Bruce is such an amazing musician and he did it so under the radar. I mean, I look Bruce still is a big cheerleader for the Beach Boys, Beach Boys, and never trumpets what he does to what he did or does for them too much. But in that span from '65 to '72, when he left that time, he, he was a huge, huge part of the group, the touring group. He went to England and promoted Pets out. He was always in England trying to help with the promotion over there and those people over there. I mean, just. You know, for him and that energy to to walk out, you know, it had to be a little bit unsettling. Sure. There's a lot of help in the studio, I'm sure, with, you know, decisions and all that stuff. So that's another significant moment. Okay, you know? so is he not on, maybe you were going to get to this, maybe I'm jumping ahead. Is he not on Carl and the Passion too? He's He's on a little bit. He, um, he says he made, he watched Brian make the track for... Uh, mess of help in the end of 71 and he actually does a review for the Carl and the Passions album shortly after he leaves the Beach Boys for one of the bigger publications at the time and he says I don't think it comes up to you know anything we did on Sunflower and Surf's Up I did watch Brian make this track I thought you okay. know, there are a couple of energy things going on. And I think you, I, he's definitely singing on some of that record. But here's the secret about Bruce leaving in 72. Again, he never, it's like Al leaving. leaving. The first, it doesn't it's actually constantly leave. Yeah. involved, even before he's made an official Beach Boy right along about 79. He's on 15 big ones. He's on love. He's on all these records, still singing, still being a part of. You know, he probably just wanted to distance himself for a little while. You know, he he did make his solo album a few years later um, that I got in there, Going Public. And, you know, he probably got ready for that. He also, um, God, I can't believe I haven't mentioned this yet. During this time when he was away from the Beach Boys is when he wrote I Write the Songs for Bar- Barry Manilow. Oh. And that w- that's his big thing that's his grammy moment oh okay yeah he won a grammy with that i one? god i need to i think so that. i oh, think yeah. he did i'm i yeah and i i hear man should, i should know that i as a matter of fact when brian finally got a grammy for the fire music in 2011 when they were when they did the smile sessions I think I read something where Bruce said, uh, you know, I've got my, you know, I've got my Grammy. I want to see Brian get his. Oh, okay. Type deal, you know. Got it. So that's. Are you going to, are you going to have me listen to that album when we get there? Or is that not necessarily. Which one is that? The the Bruce, the Bruce, Bruce's solo album. Oh yeah, sure. You know, along with Dennis's solo album, it's about, it's going on about the same time. Okay. All right. Cause you just keep having, you know, and I'm in, I'm really enjoying it, but you're having me, you know, listen to the albums of the time. And it's been really cool to see the, you know, the progression and and, just the uh, difference, the difference music from the albums, every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just didn't know if that was going to be on the, that is on the horizon horizon. when we get there. But, you know more of the con- the context of Bruce leaving it's just a huge deal because he was a part of the a big part of the machine for that 7 years so we mentioned that they're going to go to Holland right they <laughs> decide to get there's virtual i mean there's essentially n- no real planning that was that worked out for sure yeah. you know when they they didn't think about what really needed to be done um there are things like the European electricity standards and things for like right, having right, studios right. and everything like that. Were comp- what they what they did is I don't 
I don't know when Steve Desper, the guy, the masterful engineer, right, Sunflower right. Surf up, Surf's Up, it's about this time that he that he stops working with them, but they bring in another Steve. Moffat is his name, and he's a genius engineer. But the, after, I think it's only about two weeks on the job, and they've moved, I think they've moved the studio from Brian's house. Marilyn finally wants it taken out. And Dennis and Carl had found an old porn theater is what it used to be in Santa Monica that had been, and they turned it into uh, at least maybe the back of maybe they built maybe they built the mixing console in what used to be a porn. There's there's some of that there, but I've been to that location in Santa Monica oh, just cool. because of you know hell Elton recorded there uh -huh. Fleetwood Mac. Everybody in the '70s was down at Carl and Dennis's studio. Right, it's called Brother Studios. Okay, in the late '70s, you you see a lot of footage from them working in there. So they moved it from Brian's house after Holland, after everything that had been going on. I think Marilyn, more than anybody, just said, "You know, I want my house back." But this wanna... was, this wasn't in '72 though. This was later. Or this no, this, no this, is this is in this, this, this yeah, happened. kind of right before they're getting ready to go to Holland. I think it's oh, all kind okay. of going down. You got know? it, got it, okay. Um, uh, so back to what Carl gives the Steve Moffat after only a couple of weeks on the job. He says, uh, we need you to build a state-of-the-art console. And in the early 1970s, this means a completely thing, different thing than it means now. Oh, yeah, sure. And we and uh, we need you to build it, and then we need it to tear it apart, and we're going to ship it over to Holland, and we're going to install it in a recording studio over there. Nothing had been done like that at the time. He hired, I believe it's Gordon Rudd, who's a famous, he's in the engineering and electronic side of things. I Forgive me because I should know more, but I know he's a big name in, in that world. Well, the two of these guys... Nobody said it could be done in like six months, and they ended up doing it in about a month. Wow. And they build this thing. Jeez. Then they had to tear it apart, and it's so heavy, all the equipment, just to get it over there, the shipping costs on planes oh, gosh. Is, is amazing. And then they get, it, they get it over to Holland, and I guess we'll talk about that when we get, but they, they got to put it back together, and when they do, nothing works. Oh, <laughs> and... So, yeah, so he, he was he was given the task of building that console, and then, you know, things were shifting from Brian's house to this new brother studio. Sure, yeah. Steve okay. Moffat working, right? Um, on May 1st, my birthday, <laughs> um, and I didn't know this till I was researching this, the second spring single is released. Now, I don't know if we talked about the first one being released, but it doesn't matter. The second one is released. The album hasn't been released yet. Um, it's Good Time um, backed with Sweet Mountain. Okay. Which uh, Good Time never, it shows up on Love You for the Beach Boys in 77. And it's weird on that record because it's, you got the old, vo the old Beach Boys in 77 and then one tune it pops in. Here's Brian with his sweet young 1970 voice because Good Time was actually a Sunflower reject for the Beach Boys oh. and then Brian re-recorded it with Spring because he liked the tune. Okay. And then, uh, so, but anyway, this is released on as much... There, there's some things... The Spring album is very interesting, and I actually can get into all of the cuts from a musical perspective and the way that uh, David Sandler and Brian arranged and produced that. It's so quirky, and it's so out of left field for the time, and it's so unafraid. Yeah. It's just like Brian it's just definitely said, different. hey, I'm, having a, I'm just going to have fun. Yeah, I'm gonna do what, have I'm gonna fun do what I want to do. I'm gonna do this just like I'm gonna play with this new synthesizer and make noises on it. And uh, if I want to just do something with, the, you know, I it, it, I just feel like it was a way for him to just really chill out and just do what he wanted to yeah. with no commercial pressure, pressure. whatsoever. Sure. You sure. know, yeah. Um, so anyway. That was released on May 1st, which Sweet Mountain, which is on the flip side, is 
that's one of my all-time favorite Brian thing. I don't know how much that is David Sandler and how much it is Brian, but it's truly one of the most majestic pieces of music from Brian in the early 70s. Uh-huh. You know, this is also, this is that period where I, I said before, Brian was distancing himself from the Beach Boys, and this is, you know, the start of that real reclusive, famous you know, where, you know, people didn't have much access to Brian at all. And right. when they did, they were, whoa, what's going on here? Yeah. You know, because he was, you know, definitely a different cat. Yeah, You know, yeah. when he would talk to those interviewers. Um, so you have that second s- spring single on May 1st, but then in the middle of May, Carl and the Passions gets dropped. And it still does 50, I think. Oh wow. Number 50. Okay. In in so it's still got a little bit of the surfs up momentum. Got it. Um got it. on let's be it's not a real strong album. Yeah. It I mean it is just it's it's so disparate because you had Ricky and Blondie working at I think Village Recorders doing their stuff independent of the Beach Boys. I guess what happened is you know Ricky says on that uh BBC interview he goes, "You know, if Carl would have come in and mixed it, it would have been a lot better, you oh. know, or, or, you know, it's almost like they were letting those guys learn and they were willing to do it at a level of like, Hey, you guys just do your thing. We'll put it on the record. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and, and they, what they, you texted me, I think, what tune was it? Was, here, she, here she comes. Yeah, God. And that's a great wow. rock and tune. And I think here she comes. And then, um, Oh, well, I think it it is, you know, they basically got Carl to come in and sing a little bit on the end of it. On their tunes, I mean, there's just some overdubbing with the Beach Boys adding their voices to what they did, right? Yeah, right. Then you've got Dennis, who's kind of went off the deep end at this point. He's in love with Wagner, a classical composer, and he wants to create these soundscapes. And he's got Daryl Dragon, the captain, helping him out with these tunes and they are just these i mean they're beautiful but they're almost like soundtrack things for a movie and they're so overblown production wise that it's just kind of unsettling um initial reviews of the album i um i've seen where people think brother brian's heavy production hand here is is not helping things well it wasn't Brother Brian, <laughs> yeah. Even involved with you know, it was all Dennis's thing and and what you. So you have him and Daryl doing that. You have Ricky and Blondie doing their thing. Mike and Al were kind of recording independently, and then they already had some of the stuff done that Brian worked on, and so it was just a very disjointed, very fragmented. Sort no, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, the least cohesive of sure. all the Beach Boy albums, and the loosest. For sure. Even on the tunes that I like Mess of Help, it's just it's a loose rocker. And they don't there there's no real attempt at polish or anything. So who's who's singing on there's a like a, a, a distinct voice that I don't recognize on there. It's kinda like a little scratchy. Yeah, who but who is that's, that? That's Carl. He's doing that on purpose. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and he's just singing with all that grit, you know, almost to disguise you know, or, you know, just to sing heavier, you know, that was the thing of the time, you know, so that, yeah, that's Carl. Okay, I know, I, that, that was, the, that was the... She got a hole in her stock. In yeah, her. yeah. That's not the real lyric. That's the Beatrice from Baltimore lyric. I've seen those. So, well, so what's that? What's Beatrice from Baltimore? Beatrice from Baltimore is the origi- original You Need a Mess of Help to Stand Alone. That's what Brian wrote it with a guy named Tandon Almer of the association, and they had it written the all the music was written in some words which are i like a lot better than w- what jack came up for making it you need a mess of help to stand alone he turned it into more of a current statement type tune almost you know it's more yeah of so the, so when brian he so when did brian write this like he wrote it like 71 uh, okay. probably right, you right. know so it, it, yeah. it wasn't written like it wasn't one that was pulled up back. Like no, you... but actually, you know, when we talk about Marcella, Marcella comes from about three or four old songs. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. And, we'll get into and, that. But, uh, yeah, Mesa Help is, I wish, 
I've never heard a, a bootleg that has the Beatrice from Baltimore lyrics on it, but the 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 lyrics are pretty hip. You know, yeah. she, she got a hole in her stocking. She do a whole lot of rocking. Oh. She do the shake down at Bumbles. She do the Chicano rumble. Oh, okay. Da, 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 nice. da, da, Beatrice from Baltimore, oh. I think, is what, right. it, you know. <laughs> all right, all right. So then you you decided to do the cover on that one at the beginning of this episode. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, and that actually and so what? Why? why why'd you, yeah, why'd you choose expectations? that? Expectations. Well, whenever we're doing these things, and it's pretty our decision of what tune to do. Even the I, we don't really do a lot of planning. You you know yeah, that as yeah, well as no, anybody. And so it's kind yeah. of just a spontaneous thing. And and we've run into tunes that don't lend themselves too well to me putting a violin on top of it. And you know, and and so when I'm thinking about pretty tunes to do for this year, and I'm thinking about some of the stuff, maybe even Sweet Mountain I could do. But how well is that gonna? Or uh, all this is that would be a is a beautiful tune that uh -huh. would be kind of cool to do. But then I just landed on mess of help, and I'm glad you men mentioned this because I wanted to tell people that when I was God, it was a few months ago, and I guess it was listening to the feel flow set because mess of help the track is on there. Oh, okay. And in the rhythm track, of course, there's been strings and violins used on Beach Boy recording since the early 60s and then Pet Sounds, of course, and Smile and all that. So it's not like there's never been a violin on their stuff. I was hearing this, dun, 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 and I go, whoa, that could be a fiddle in there. And I got to listen. I thought, am I right? Because even I, I can't, you know, the textures are hidden so well. I'm going, wait, is that something else? Or is that really? And I, and the more I get to listen to it, it is, it, it's a fiddle in there on the rhythm track. Oh. But, because there's a banjo on there too. If you hear, you know, I mean, it's kind of a hodgepodge of like, it's like a rock bluegrass track is what it is. And so, um, and Brian had done some work with country artists with uh, Fred Vale, one of their managers, around the Sunflower time. And so he, I'm sure, I think this might be a guy named Gordon Terry playing the fiddle on here because he used some of those guys from those sessions. So anyway, combination of that, because I wanted to use the way, the violin, the way they used it on that track. I should say the fiddle because this is the only time they really got it. Fiddle. fiddle going on i was i was uh just running the changes this morning and yeah. i was just i was rocking out to it like i haven't on any other thing that we've done it's like oh my gosh this is going to be completely different nice perfect yeah. cool 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 okay so then here she comes that's okay. the next track mm -hmm. and you know sometimes songs when you as soon as you hear them you're you, it's an instant you instantly like them and, mm -hmm. and i'm a sucker for a good bass line and how that's that bass comes in on the mm -hmm. song followed by the piano i mean i was for me that was just like and that's when i text you i think maybe a couple minutes into the song i was just like yep here she comes it's my new favorite um even the drum fills on it I yeah mean, well like, it's ricky i mean he's just the master drummer of the 1970s i mean that's just and so sorry remind me now that i'm getting this you know the, the context here Ricky was on Surf's Up I'm sure I'm sure that he was playing so yeah and Blondie did a little bit of session work on Surf's Up also but okay. but that's Surf's Up is the album when Dennis injures the hand he uh Dennis says in around that time that he didn't know if he'd ever play the drums again he said the last song I will play drums on studio wise is student de demonstration time oh Dennis had played drums on that Got it. Okay. Okay. And so, anyway. all right. And so the um, this song is like uh, I mean, just I mean, it has everything I like about you know it has some awesome piano solos, awesome guitar solos. It was just it complete. It's nothing like it on any other Beach Boy record. No, nothing it's because like because it's it. not the Beach Boys. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that, that was one thing I noticed. It was like this is nothing like it, and it uh, it, it's like almost like a jam band type mm -hmm. of song, like where yeah. you just like. When there's, uh, you know, you at the show where you're just like, oh, this song just keeps going. Like, that's why know? I love the early 70s live stuff. And when we get to next year on that 73 album, which I'm going to, that in concert album, it they were, there is, they were that jam band and this incredible band that was still presenting these arrangements. It's just a comp, it was a mystical combination 
of things. And, and I, and Ricky con- and Blondie really brought that magic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and that's that was just the biggest thing too. Where it just was the, the big difference was just like how jammy that this song was. Um, but then we go into Marcella, which this is actually. Oh no, no, we don't. I'm sorry. He come down. I was mm-hmm. I was looking ahead in my notes. He come down. So the funny thing about this song is when I first heard it, just first run through, nah. No, uh-huh. not my no. Not this gospel y mm-hmm. type. No, not yeah, my I'm gonna not, tell you something about this one that'll nah, blow your mind after. Not you get my done thing. But me. but then I listened to, so then I listened to it again because I'll listen to these songs a couple of times before I, you know, before I, I pass judgment. And the the you know listening to start hearing some of the lyrics and what they're saying, and then it's like oh okay I see what they're doing here mm-hmm. they're doing this gospely praise the Lord type but genre linking it to, but linking it mm-hmm. to the meditation yes, type stuff yes yes absolutely brilliant and so the the neat thing I have to tell you about Carl and Pat here we just said it was the most disjointed loosest beach boy album probably the last thing i'd ever play for somebody if they were if i was wanting to give them a primer on the beach boys right when it was released re-released in the early 90s guess who wrote the liners for it and it who's his it says it's his favorite album and he loves what carl did with it elton Elton John. Elton John. Oh, this wow. is he said this. And is Elton then, John's favorite. And wow. then he makes mention of this he come down thing and how how brilliant it and and it's like I wasn't expecting Elton John to love the Carl and the Passions album. I was never expecting him to, to like that he track. Come down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean the But the, I've got that I I have to let you read that liner. No, the the it was. I absolutely respect that that move. I mean, that is just that's. I don't know. I still don't necessarily like that song, but no, I respect the song because of what they're doing on it. You know, it's tongue in cheek. Yeah, it's very it's, and it's very. It, it's a very inside move at this time. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's just uh, everything they do, whether it's smoking pot on Smiley Smile. Uh-huh. You know that nobody really knows about. You know, and they, yeah. you know the, the little things that are on the records as you go through. You go, Ooh, they were. A, Sneaky, sneaky, yeah. sneaky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so Marcella now, and this is the first song that I get to on the album that actually sounds like the Beach Boys. Mm-hmm. I don't even think you need a mess of help. I don't even, that one doesn't have a Beach Boys feel to me mm-hmm. either. But when you get to Marcella, it's like, oh, okay, that's, there's that Beach Boys sound that I'm, that I'm used to. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't really have a, I know that this, you, you love this song. I, and I like the song, um, and it's one of those songs, the more I hear it, the more I like it, but I don't really necessarily have any, like, you know, insight on it from, you know, my perspective anyway. Right. Well, the, the wait, one of the things is I, the only version I knew for years, because I never heard, I didn't hear Carl and Passion's album proper until I was in college. Um, but the only I had the in in concert album from seventy three, which has the live rocking ass version of Marcella, Marcella on it, and that's the thing I fell in love with when I was introduced to the studio version for the first time. I go, oh wow, this is a lot. This is a lot more understated. This is slower. Sure. This is everything. But it's uh, it's a really interesting tune, and then it's about it's it's. It dates, you know, there's a tune from 1964 that Brian was working on during the all summer long sessions called All Dressed Up for School that finally, at first during the Sunflower sessions, there's a tune called I Just Got My Pay that never got released. Um, it had elements of that in there. But then by that time, they they had parts of All Dressed Up for School and then I Just Got My Pay And then that got rejected, so they weren't going to use that. So they finally recycling all dressed up for school, and I just got my pay. And this new uh, remnant that Dennis was telling somebody was called "One Arm Over My Shoulder." And somebody asked him, yelled out a question to him in the early before this came out, probably around this time. And they said, "Hey, is the new tune going to be called called Marcella or One Arm Over My Shoulder?" And Dennis yelled out. They're the same song, <laughs> you know, and so, um, but it re- all those guys were excited about it. Yeah, they felt like it captured 
it was it, it's a great Brian will you know well as Carl puts it together this I think I told you that <laughs> you know Brian comes down and sings a line on it or yeah or, yeah or something like that but you know it's his it's his music and and his ideas and I I've grown to love the studio version because of some of the there's some really neat sounds right at the beginning there's a little I think it's what they call a zither Zing, you know it's, oh, there's a really interesting that's not on the live version at all but right. some of those little touches well I'm excited to hear the live version where is it yeah there's, there's been plenty of uh, songs just you know going to shows in my life where I go and I check out, and I don't necessarily like that the song that much on the album, but then I hear it live, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like my yeah. new favorite song. Kind of you kind of hear it in a whole different, mm-hmm. you know, from a whole new perspective. The like guitars, that. the guitars are so the the riff is so sick. Yeah, and and the, the way that they that they that it's harmonized, which is a creation of Brian's. Uh-huh. Ultimately, it's just it kind of revolutionary, and there's. A lot of con, you know speculation that and that Brian had written this for the Stones. Oh, really? And when you hear the live version of it, you makes you sen- makes sense. Understand that a lot more. Yeah. Okay. You, 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 it, it it will come into to focus. Sure. A little bit more. Okay. And then uh, hold on, dear brother. I don't know why I like this song, but I like this song. There's it's the flame like, again. Yeah. Is that? That's that's Ricky and Blondie. Yeah, and it's. I mean, obviously, it, it 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 doesn't sound Beach Boys. I think the the reason why I would normally not like it is kind of has like a twangy guitar on it. Uh huh. Yeah. Know? Well, well, that's the steel guitar, and Ricky's playing on on that. But the early '70s were a real big Southern rock, country rock time, right? And so whether it was Al getting Red Rhodes to play a steel guitar on cotton fields a couple of years before that, or Ricky coming in and, you know, all that stuff was kind of super hip at the time. Yeah. To kind of, you know, that's why you got the banjo and the fiddle on Mess of Help probably. Right, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that makes sense. But Ricky was a real talented. I mean, a steel guitar is a hard instrument to play, especially a pedal steel is yeah. what he was playing. Uh-huh. And it, Ricky is an amazing drummer. Uh, I don't know what all he, but as far as like an organ, he's doing an organ solo on the 1973 car. I didn't know it was him for years. I thought it was a, one of the supporting musicians. Just mind blowing. Oh, I mean, nice. these guys are, the musicianship well, is just off the charts. It's funny. On my notes here, I say very different. Doesn't sound like the Beach Boys. Like, <laughs> like once again, because it's, uh, it's, it's not. Ricky and Blondie yeah. okay. working by themselves. Okay. So let's talk about Make It Good. Mm hmm. Because. I mean, I listen to it, but like, if I'm listening to an album, I'm gonna be completely honest. Nine times out of ten, I'm skipping this song mm-hmm. because it just it doesn't. It's it's just I don't know what's going on. What's going on with this song? Well, it's just Dem, Dennis is, you know, such an amazing story. Dennis as a musician and and how he kind of came up as a almost an afterthought as being part of the group uh-huh. coming in. But then, you know, in the late 60s, actually starts writing some tunes that, you know, you know, like Bruce says that he helped him, you know, in the mid-60s with understanding the piano a little bit more, and that's when Dennis started to kind of actually start to put some tunes together. But the story is just so wild and organic, and it happened so quickly that he just never really had a chance to get a hold of himself. And he's kind of constantly getting... So he got way ahead of himself with this. He got really in love with classical music at the time and wanted to do this big... With this and um, c- Cuddle Up. It's, uh-huh. They're these great big production things where I find music... There's interesting music within both of them for sure. Um, but I get tired of the yeah. overblown, yeah. heavy-handed production. Yes, and that's Cuddle why up, I, I have similar notes on Cuddle Up. Same, yeah, it's that. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's, it's that same. Those sort aren't of... things that I, 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 I like listening to the demos of those songs more than the actual songs because they're abbreviated and they kind of get the the main ideas in there in a more clear-cut way. Right, right. A little know? more concise for sure. So then that just leaves because we just kind of mentioned cuddle up, but so that just leaves all this, all this is that, which I mean, that's meditation heaven there. This, I love the title, I love the lyrics, and I just, 
I don't love the I don't love uh the actual like all this is that when that part when they mm-hmm. sing that that's part. kind of a that's that's the mantra part of the, it yeah for and them. I'm not yeah. but the um the way that they sing two ways and and I both and that's Carl that's the Carl the way that that melody is oh my that is one just, of the most most sublime moments in Beach Boy history that is I mean every I would like rewind just to to listen to that part Juxtapose again. Juxtapose Carl's voice on Messa Help at the beginning of the album to to what he reverts to as his beautiful, soft... Right, yes. The, and it, you know, I don't even, know, I don't even know what that means. Singing. Is there a... Is there a like what, what? I don't even know what that means. I, I like I. I. It's like a something a, a quote I want to like put on my wall. And I don't even know what it means. All this is that. No, no. Two oh. ways, and I both travel by. Oh yeah, and and it, two two way. It's some of that comes from uh the Robert. I think the Robert Frost poem of, oh, of the road okay. not taken. Maybe yeah, the road less yeah, traveled. Yeah, ro- I mean yeah, and so uh I think that some of that is in there, but the, and it might be two waves and I both travel by oh it might or two ways i'm not i'm you know i've never really you know i, I know you're not a, i know you're me, not a big lyric but know, i like, like you, you know, know the more i think about things like that it's interesting well and, and it's funny because robert frost I, mean, I actually did a, a uh like a high school or maybe middle school or early high school thing on um the road less traveled so mm-hmm. maybe that's why it, it it stuck out i mean other than like you said completely sublime and beautiful i mean just yeah. god how that hits it's just like oh man yeah this is this was this is one from carl and the passions that they did on the 50th you know it got you know it it, it it's a beautiful tune that nobody knew about for years right. that finally that you know it's a it's a high it's a high point for that but again so different and then sandwiched in between dennis's two big monster yeah. things is kind of it's a weird sequencing for yeah for that so, so why and, and just last thing and we'll get and we'll move on um to a little more history and then get to spring but so tough like it's calling the passions but then i noticed on the album it says so tough yeah i think that's kind of a that that was more of a of the times like so tough was you know we're getting it okay you know? and carl and the passions that comes from and maybe it's a nod to the fact that carl's doing all the work now mm-hmm. but when when they when they were in high school at least at one assembly that Brian wanted to get Carl to participate in, but Carl didn't want to, Brian said, okay, we'll call the group Carl and the Passions. Oh, all right. And so well, that's where that, that comes as, as, right. as, 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 and, but the marketing for Carl and the Passions is you can't, when you, that's got that red, there's a car on the front of it. You just see the side of a car and, uh, you could bear it. I don't even know if it says the Beach Boys on the front of the cover. And it was also, this was released in tandem with a reissue of Pet Sounds. Interesting. Because and because the new record company had had acquired the rights, and they want some money. People, yeah. <laughs> and but but you know that's kind of an interesting way to put out your new product to put re-release <laughs> yeah. it with the greatest thing you ever did right right you know so yeah. you could stand right there and compare the two you know yeah so so that's that's one of I've, i'm glad i remembered to say that about that because carl and the passions was was released in tandem with 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 a re-release of pet sounds yeah the first one the first re- re-release mm-hmm. oh interesting all right so there's the Carl and the Passions album. So right, yeah, that's it. So May, then, so we're in May of seventy two. Yeah. So in June, they get ready to move to Holland. Okay. And um, there is a, f- a a clip of them at the Crystal Palace in London in June, right at the beginning of June. It must have been when they were kind of heading over there, where uh, it's the the full kick butt group you know and uh elton sits in with them he's on this clip it's two or three songs people that just look crystal palace beach boys 1972 and it'll come up and uh-huh. it's an outdoor festival thing it's just really neat document of that period um then they take, take how many people Six or seven people, their families, uh, their like 
people that worked for them, their fa- you know, everybody had to have houses. Everybody had to have cars uh-huh. rented for them. And they w- initially, Jack Riley thought he was going to get them all within shit. They ended up being spread 30 miles apart from each other. All, all of them had to drive into this location that they, the, um, they had found a barn out there that they converted into a studio. They the Ricky and Blondie laugh about the fact that when you know the cows got too close, they had to stop recording because they could hear them. You know, or <laughs> wow, hear it, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah they just farmland. Yeah, and uh, with all the you know, so Steve Moffat was over there building that thing, and just problems after problems. They they're having trouble getting housing for everybody. They can't get the car, you know, it's just a nightmare. Uh-huh. Um, they, Brian or Jack talks, you know, Brian into going before they go, but everybody else goes over first. Okay. And I'm not sure of the exact time, but Brian started to go once. And he got as far as the LA airport. And then I think he didn't make it any further. Or they found him asleep. What? In the in wait, the wait, wait. like the duty free lounge or something like that, you just lay or mate. But then, so he finally they do get him on a plane to Holland, and I think what happens is maybe he, when he got to Holland, he got off the plane and just fell asleep in a in a some sort of a you know some, area some of bench. the airport. Yeah. Somebody found you know, and they got him and. <laughs> Jeez. So I I put in my notes to say you know Brian does get there but he has a a bit of a hard time just get yeah, just, yeah. Getting just getting there. there yeah but when he got over there uh, Marilyn talks about it being really wonderful for them and he actually rode a bike every day and was a little bit healthier um, just the the pace was getting a lot of, less yeah, hectic getting and, out of L.A. and yeah their their little girls Carney and Wendy were real little and there's pictures of them from this time that looked like hey it looks like Brian's you know as happy as he was right at right. that at that time that's cool um he was also he was famously there's a Randy Newman album at that time called Sail Away that had come out and he what he said he would do is sit around and drink apple sap, apple sap, which is, or I think it was some sort of alcoholic uh-huh. apple cider that he was drinking, and he would listen to this album of Randy Newman's "The Sail Away," and he composed the Mount Vernon and Fairway fairy tale that ends up being on the Holland album, but it's this crazy story where he had to have this other album playing so he could write out the story of the fairy tale and all this. And that was kind of like his, you know, he was over there having fun, not being too involved. He says, I'd go in there and lay on the floor and listen to Carl produce. Yeah. He says that in long promise road. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned that Marcella gets released in the end of June. And I thought growing up, especially hearing that live version that, Wow, they must not have ever released Marcella because Marcella would have been a hit in the early 70s. But they did. Oh, yeah. And nothing. And nothing. (laughs) Crickets. Yeah, June 26th. And And nothing. uh, Yeah, yeah. yeah. So 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 just kind of back to Carl and the Passions. What else did they release off of – what else were their singles off of Carl and the Passions? You know, I think Mesa Help. Mesa Help and then Marcella. Yeah, and I I need to take a look. I think so. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, what's the one quote that I hear from that time? It just goes to show that Brian can be stoned half out of it and still be making the best music on the record. Yeah, here, so yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Here, um, but in July, so I don't know if this is actually before Brian gets over to Holland finally or not. Um, that's when the spring album proper gets released. So all of this stuff that, for Brian distancing himself from the Beach Boys and not being involved, all all the while, he's had this little play thing that he's been that doing. He's, he's been, been doing. doing bef- so this with, is all done before he left for Holland. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, and I don't think any of it was worked on. I, I think it was released about the same time they left for Holland. Okay. So all the work had been had been done. Okay. Um, but that's so that's that's in July, and so. We should probably st- talk, right here talk and about talk the, about the okay. spring record. So, what well, I didn't expect to see hear so many covers. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I should I, have told you about that part of that's it. That's okay. But. It was, you know, it was a nice little surprise. I mean, Tennessee Waltz is how it starts out. I would have never even known <laughs> Tennessee Waltz unless I'd been working with you yeah. on helping you, you know, with the, the fiddle lessons and stuff like that. I would have never even known that song, but, you know, the first song is uh, Tennessee Waltz. And then, um, I'm so to keep this episode reasonable, uh, reasonable length here, I'm going to kind of rifle through some of these. Okay. I, don't, I don't think I'm going to spend too much time on, on all of them, especially the covers. Okay. Um, but stop me if you, cause if like, mm-hmm. if you have anything to say on these. Okay. So then thinking about you, baby, that's mm-hmm. Darlin, right? That was the first version of Darlin that Mike and Brian wrote in 1964 that a gal, they got a gal to record that, uh, thinking about you, baby. And, and Brian always loved that version of Darlin, but that is definitely Darlin, the first, you know, parts of it that right. they turned into Darlin. So then, so musically there's Darlin is, uh, it's the same as Darlin music. What, what? Yeah, almost, no, like, thinking about you, baby, the front the part of it is, is, is. What's that? Is it the lyrics that the only thing that they change on? No, the, their... some of the music, okay. most of the music is the same. But when it gets to out of the the verses into the into the chorus, the structure changes. Oh, okay. it's a different tune than Darlin at that point. Got it. But man, when the first time I heard "Thinking About You, Baby," it was probably not the spring version, but it was probably a bootleg of the early six. And I'm going, well, that's Darlin. Yeah. And it definitely was. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mama said, "That's not." That's a cover, no, that's, right? Yeah, and then superstar. That's a cover. Cover. Yeah. And these were all the cool thing about it. These were all they weren't established covers that had become oh, really? famous or anything. These are recent tunes that either the gals had heard or Brian or David Sandler and said, "Hey, you know that that's kind of a cool tune. Let's cover that." Yeah. The 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 the, the insane thing too is they covered some of Dennis's music. You know, with yeah, forever. forever, and yeah, then yeah. Uh, the I don't think the the fallen in love single that Dennis wrote was not on the album, but there's I um oh it's on the other yeah. side of shine away. That's yeah. Right. So and 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 um this whole world, mm-hmm. I love that. I love their version of it. Honestly, I thought it was really nice. The, this the vamp in the middle is so crazy, yeah. and and I I love it too. It's it's it, the. I got an interesting observation on on Marilyn and Diane. I think they're both great singers, but I think in this, Brian and themselves didn't demand perfection sure. out of these vocals, sure. and it because that's really not Brian's thing anyway. Right, you know, <laughs> believe it or not, yeah. for the most pristine vocalist of the nineteen sixties. Right, right. You know, and so it yeah, I mean, it's hard to compare Marilyn's vocal to Carl's. You know, for you know to yeah. to, oh, to yeah. get that same emotion out of no, it. But the, I, I it, love yeah. the softer production yes. and the piano on this. But also, I'm I'm sure it could have been either one of them because I think David Sandler at the time was equally as weird as Brian. That's what he was. <laughs> yeah. the, excuse me. That's why he was brought in. Yeah. You know, he could kind of be on that same level yeah, yeah 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 and so that vamp that they put in the middle of that that's uh star or bright star, yeah all that stuff you know and, is, and, and then twinkle twinkle little star in an off kilter way yeah in the end of that yep. thing that whole yeah whoa yeah no it was you talk about something that <laughs> the one i like that they just put a little spin on it they didn't keep it the exact same you know mm-hmm. i thought that was well and it's, it's the composer yeah. Putting it's a, this is a, the case. Brian's covering himself, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so then, falling in love. I didn't realize that 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 was that's a cover as well. Well, that's Dennis's. That's tune. That's Dennis's tune. Okay. Yeah, and, and then, it's not on the. I don't believe it's on the spring album. So it's on that's the, a, one thing I want to mention is I couldn't find this album on like Spotify, um, and so I just had to YouTube. I just found a YouTube playlist that they yeah, had. Yeah, I've kind of figured. they had all the songs. Uh, and then, so I did have fallen in love on on this YouTube right. The playlist, playlist would be so, anything for spring would have um, that on. There, but yeah. any other covers because that's a, forever. This whole world. So those are the only ones that I recognize. But that doesn't. Right. I, I know that there could be other covers on here. You know, I heard Bud was the first guy that had a copy of the spring album that I okay. got to hear. But just blew my Bud Goodman. Song. Yeah, from a, one of our season episodes, one episodes. Yeah, yeah and yeah. he. Uh, I remember hearing Tennessee Waltz open that you know and you thought revelation to you yeah you what? for sure yeah, yeah whoa yeah. you know and uh so when i 
I didn't know some of the songs were even covers when I first heard the album because I just didn't have that much context and I hadn't heard a lot of that classic early 70s rock that right but um oh down home oh, okay down home's a cover I didn't know that it was and 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 uh also the cool thing is on some of this you know Carl is singing on their album you know oh, he really? sings on part of forever his he okay. redoes Brian's part from the sunflower stuff and then on down home I know specifically his voice is on it. So Carl came in and helped with the spring stuff, and Dennis lent his tunes. And, right, you know, right, so right. it's more of a of a thing happening yeah. than just Brian by himself, sure, right? Sure, sure. But Down Home, I think, is originally a, or it's a Carol King tune. Okay. And I didn't know that. Yeah. So. De- see, I would definitely not know that. Okay, so let's just start running through these. Uh, Awake. That's a cover. That's, That's a an cover? old, old tune. Okay, and I just wasn't a real big fan of it. Uh-huh. Uh, Sweet Mountain, you kind of you mentioned that. So this this was an original to to this mm-hmm. album. Yeah, this is and one so of the Brian. For and... me, I I don't really like it until about two minutes in when the when you start to hear I, I don't know trumpet or saxophone or, or some horn comes in. I can't remember what it is, but that's when it starts to I, for me it starts to get a little more interesting to mm-hmm. me. And then I think another minute after that. Um, some other vocals come in and and so right so the whole thing is it's hard to you can't even tell what chords he's superimposing with all this synth stuff going on it's not the first part of it's murky but the end of it when they shift into it's a famous beach boy tag where he gets all kinds of shit yeah. going on and his line is it rained on it rained on yeah yep. it rained that's all he's saying rained on yeah. if you listen to that again that's just brian sings that one mm-hmm. little part and then david sandler is the guy well it rained on the mountain the mountain of love oh. and he didn't do much singing on the album but i mean and then the girls are doing all kinds of different little background things it's just the the typical tag of a of a real interesting beach boy record but one of my favorites that brian ever did yeah uh everybody I don't know. Everybody, I, that's another cover. Never, another cover. Okay. Yeah, you said it. See, that's one, two, already th- three that I didn't realize were, were covers. Um, good time. That's not. That's that's. I that's love Brian this one. and Al's tune. I love this one. Kinda, from Sunflower. Yeah. That's why you like it. It's from Sunflower? It was rejected on one of the first oh, versions of got Sunflower. Oh, got it, got it. I was like, did I miss it? No, you know what's funny is it kind of reminds me of... Um, not from sunflower, but from surf. The quirkiness of like say, take a load off your feet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They were. I just got my pay that I just mentioned for was another one of those kind of day in the life mundane lyrics about you know going yeah. to work and getting a paycheck and yeah, you know it's you know with some really cool music. Yeah, a lot of fun. Just <laughs> yeah. the songs are just a lot of fun. I mean, it's it might be my favorite. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it might be. It's probably second. Mm-hmm. Um. Now that everything's been said, another cover. Another cover. Mm-hmm. Okay, so geez, well, that's another cover. Uh, we already talked about Down Home, Shine Away. Okay, so now we can talk about Shine. Well, Away. no, we're gonna wait okay, for Shine gonna... Away because there was one after the Spring album in 1973. There was one last Spring single released, and okay, so that's... let me see if I got it. So um, I'll skip that one. We talked about Falling in Love, Had to Phone Ya. That's an original. That's, That's an original. Bird. Yeah, and that shows up on 15 big ones for okay. the Beach Boys. And then Snowflakes. Snowflakes is not I was not on the not on the album and that's probably a boot I think I have heard that and that's a bootleg okay I didn't thing. really I yeah. didn't, really didn't like it so then I, I might be missing one then what was the other one that came out that was you said mm-hmm. there so why can't we talk about shine away yet because we're not in 1973. Oh, so we got to wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to okay. wait and talk Fair. about that one last spring thing okay. when we're in the middle of talking to the Okay, well that's that's the my YouTube playlist version of spring that I that I looked up. And, and it wasn't bad, but I I can't say that I, you know, it's going to be my my go-to or like right. kind of how you put it. It's not how you would introduce somebody to the Beach Boys or obviously it's not the Beach Boys, but it's that same. I don't know if I'd really sh- tell people to listen to it. I will tell you this. It's one of the albums I will put on the most down here. It's when, along with the friend. When I want to, it's, it's not real heavy. Yeah. And it's, it's not real. I love, every time I listen to it, there's so much 
crazy stuff that Sandler and, and Brian did that I, I'm constantly kind of catching new things on it. And so it's, you know, even though it's done in a very eccentric, unorthodox way, it's one of those things from Brian where I constantly am getting all kinds of new little things all the time. Two little, yeah, 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 yeah. New little so, nuggets, yeah, for sure. And and uh, I I also the way that the regular album just plays and flows is kind of nice to me. The sequencing on the original that starts with Tennessee Waltz and then goes through I think to Down Home on the end. It yeah. just seems like it plays pretty well. Nice. Okay. Okay. So then we need to wrap up our our timeline here on. on yeah. On well, we got to talk so, about the Beach Boys being in Holland. Right. Right. That was about a six month deal for them. Um. They worked on album, obviously. Got a, you know, we're still in seventy two. That album is not released till the next year. Right, right. They come back in October. Oh, they come back in they go. So they go and they come back in seventy two. Okay. Yeah. All right. And um, you know, I did talk about the fairy tale a little bit and that Brian was working on that and it kind of his big little play thing over there while they were working on the rest of the record. You do have to, Funky Pretty is on Holland though too. I don't want to talk too much about yeah, that. Yeah, we'll get into that next time. There's some great Brian music on on the record. Um they came back in October and guess what? What's that? Holland was rejected. <laughs> oh, of course it was. <laughs> After all that well, money. money. Whew. And Taking that studio over there, doing all, getting everybody. Um, okay, and they was real rejected quick. because there was. They said there was no single on the record. Did, just, just because I'm curious, did Brian make it the whole time there, or did he end up leaving early? No, he he. Once he got over there, I good. think he was there until with the everybody okay. until everybody came back. Okay, sorry, go on. No, I, I, that's a good question. Um, but the reason that uh, Warner reprise set gave for not. Um, rejecting the album basically is there was lack of a single mm-hmm. well in comes old van dyke parks again who's okay. working for warner brothers is a big reason warner brothers signed the beach boys in 1970 you know mm-hmm. and he had a tape of a tune that brian and he had started working on i think in 71 so this is the time of the surfs up album sure and i've never heard it but it's it's famously opens with Brian and Van Dyke sitting down at a piano and and I think Van Dyke says uh Brian play the tune and Brian starts convince me I'm not crazy Van Dyke convince me I'm not crazy and and Van Dyke says you know stop the bullshit and just play the tune and it's Ceylon Sailor oh okay which I actually didn't know that one yeah 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 and so we're not going to talk a lot about nope. that because it gets released the next year, but all of a sudden uh, Van Dyke is given Warners and, it, you know, they, hey, I've got the tune that's going to mm-hmm. save this record, you know. or you know, So Carl gets busy working on the work that Van Dyke... I, Steve Desper says he recorded a version of it in 71 that is the basis for what they used on the final released version so it was around for a couple of years there are so many writing credits on sail on sailor we'll get into that story like i said um next year but that's basically the end of 72 is they come back with the goods from holland no no we don't like it rejected oh, van dyke says uh i think i got something we were working on a couple of years ago that might just fit the bill for the single all right that's where it ends and so then we'll pick up with that on the next episode, I will do. I will do my homework. Am I just listening to Holland for this, or is there Holland and in concert? Holland and in concert. I yes, need to, yes. I need and to... in, in concert is is a show that, or it's a uh, album that Carl produced in seventy three. That was a combination of the the seventy two and the seventy three tours. Okay, they recorded a bunch of those shows, and then Carl was able to go through and cherry pick. Got it. Okay. Stuff from that and create a Beach Boys in concert album cool. from that. And so okay. that's what you'll be listening to. Perfect. Okay. Well, that will wrap it up for this episode. I, this one might be long. I don't know. We'll see. We might be over an hour here. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Hop on the YouTube. Check out uh, the visuals we got going on behind us. Check out the 
covers that Matthew's been putting together. And we will see you next time.